Hello everyone, this is a new session where I get to walk you through a quick upgrade to the engineering standard. If you're not familiar with the standard, it's a, a collection of ideas, theories, principles, patterns, and tools that enable software engineers, especially ones that are starting in the tech industry, to be able to develop clean, test-driven, pair-programmed uh, systems. Think about it as a holistic uh, framework that kind of enables you to see the end-to-end -end picture uh, of, of how to navigate into this wide ocean of knowledge when it comes to developing software and architecting systems and all that kind of good stuff. This particular uh, session though is specifically about an upgrade. The standard is in, always will be in draft mode because we, will, we are always evolving, we are always you know generating new ideas. When we engage with the standard community and develop projects, we run into issues and problems that kind of um, uh, inspires us to kind of go back and rethink how we used to do things and then we get to upgrade these things. This is an intentional uh, systematic effort to ensure that we're always putting the highest quality uh, uh, of software possible out there. So this particular uh, announcement, this is the standard version 2.10 Point oh. This particular release is mainly focusing on how we test drive exception handling, right? I'm going to show you an existing project, you know, a project that we're already working on, the Entity Intelligence Project, and I'm going to show you how we handle exceptions today and what does this change mean and why is it important that you kind of upgrade your existing standard compliant systems or if you're starting from scratch you follow this new pattern to make sure that your uh, uh, functions and foundation services are r right spot on testing all the little changes and truly protecting your code from any potential changes so uh, without any further ado let's just go ahead and and jump straight into the um, Visual Studio here, and you will see here in the in the Entity Intelligence project. This is this is where this came from, right? We were basically sitting down, writing systems. Never write things the same way you've been doing it like five or six months ago. That basically means that you're not really growing. You're not doing anything. Let's just look at this. This is an already merged feature, right? This is a a a a foundation service that retrieves a SQL query, right? And if you go inside that SQL query. Uh, implementation. So if it's right, right click, go to implementation here. It'll basically go and hit um, uh, uh, the Open AI library, right, which also needs an upgrade. And it basically retrieves back a SQL query. So it does a prompt, basically. It's prompting uh, uh, the the AI uh, broker to kind of give us back a SQL query in return. The problem that you see here is that we're basically uh, testing that we're throwing a dependency validation exception on retrieve. So when we're retrieving this query, if the API or the library that's that's wrapping up that API is throwing an exception, uh, we need to be able to handle it and localize it and ca categorize it. So if we get a completion client validation exception, we need to go and say, okay, there is invalid AI query exception error that happened, and then we wrap that up in a dependency validation exception. Why we localize and categorize, that's a completely different discussion, a completely different story. The problem with this test, though, is that the message that comes out to the end user, right? If you look at the message that comes out to the end user, you'll see here, if I go and just basically literally just take all everything in here, this message that our end user will see, and I just literally just do this. So it's just, just put garbage in there. And then I go back to my tests and basically do control R, control T just to run the test. The test is passing. Watch, watch. It's going to run the test. Here we go. And the test is passing. That's a huge problem, right? Because if you're building truly clean systems, clean software, these tests, in addition to the fact that they're supposed to be documentation to how your code and why your code is doing what it's doing, uh, it's also supposed to protect existing implementation from ongoing changes that are happening in its project. Let's say someone comes 10 years from now and decides that they want to change something in a business logic. Something needs to bark at them, you know, and say, hey, you can't do that. You can't do that because this is a... Um, this is a violation of the initial assumptions that the developers of this library uh, decided to take. So this is, of course, a problem, right? I thought a lot about this problem. If you go back to the uh, initial session, 
uh, we thought a lot about different ideas. We basically said maybe we need to go in here and basically say, well, the actual AI dependency, the inner exception, that message should should and then be and then you pass an expected message in here. But it didn't feel very natural to me. It seems like additional validations that we're doing on top. Uh, but if we're actually building the expected exceptions, why don't we just put it in there? I mean, models are supposed to be data carriers in the first place. Uh, having data by default in the model the way we do in the exception is not my favorite way of doing things because these models are supposed to be anemic. They're not supposed to carry anything by default. They're, you're supposed to um, uh, fill them in with data, you know, as you go forward. This is, this is why I have my own apprehensions against, you know, having default values and default variables set up to these properties on these classes. They need to be dumb. They need to be just containers and they're shaped to contain certain information with a certain data type. So how do we solve this problem? Can you just, you know, can do you have the same problem in your system, even if it's not standard compliant? Do you have the issue with the exception message is baked into the exception and because the test and the business logic are throwing the exact same type of exception now we have the problem of anybody could just go in and put any garbage in there and you wouldn't know what's going on i'll copy this message for a reason and then i'm going to go up in here and say this public so here's how we're going to solve this i'm going to do another overload right and this overload will have a message and the exception itself this is particularly see how test driven development basically truly changes how, the way you think about software and how you're going to implement software. I don't know why the autocomplete does message message. That's quite strange to me, even though it did understand, like, see, this is like a faux pas or kind of a little problem in the way the generation happened. But that's just that's just a note for the Visual Studio team. You know, I know some of you are watching. So heads up, you know, this is this is weird to have to do message message like that, especially if it's not consistent with the second variable. Okay, so I'm creating this particular overload. So now I have an overload that actually takes a message and an inner exception, right? There's one that doesn't take anything at all. There is one that takes an inner exception. That's the one coming from the outside world, which is the case that we're testing here. And then there is this one and this one specifically to allow tests to be able to go and say, no, this is the message that is actually supposed to go in there. So now let's see what, what, what happens here. If I go back to this particular test that I was having and I change my invalid AI query exception this way, so now it's message and now I'm pasting that exact message I copied earlier. And now since I'm using this just for beauty, really care about the beauty of your software. So now I have this expected message. I'm explicitly saying this is supposed to say invalid AI query error occurred. Fix the errors and try again. Okay, now let's run this test again and see what happens. This test is now failing. It's failing, and if you go here, thanks to uh, Christo and the team that really puts a lot of time and effort into this, if you see why it's failing, I'm going to open the error for you here. It says, hey, I expected you to have an invalid AI query error occurred, but found this garbage. Look, look at this. I found this this garbage that you put in there in your exception. So now that doesn't make any sense because nobody could just go in and change your exception messages without actually notifying uh, the test or changing at least the test to match to match that. So now I am forced to actually go back. I can't actually do that. Now I have to put that message in there. And if and only if I put that message back in there, I'll be able to run this. There you go. And that basically you know, it, it makes that test pass. This needs to apply to every exception, right? So this exception here, but also this exception right here. So this guy also needs to be public AI dependency validation exception, and it needs to take a message like this, and it needs to take an inner exception. And we're basically saying base and put that open close parens down there, and we should be, we should be golden here. Okay, so that basically then means that in our messages, I can go now and say, this is the message. This is what I expect to have like that. And this is, this is how our standard compliant tests 
for this. It's a little bit more work, of course, but that's what it takes to write proper things, right? If you know, there's this triangle uh, between uh, quality, time, and cost, right? And the standard goes for quality, quality, and quality, right? Or at least that's the joke. So if you want to build something clean, that's the way to take it. How long it ta how long time it takes, or if you want to run fast, that's a problem for you to solve. That's not what the standard is trying to solve for you here, at least not for that from that engineering perspective. Okay, now let me run this again. And now this test is passing. So now anybody that just thinks that they could just go and change some stuff like this, now we have to verify this. If you run this code like that, it should fail. It says, hey, your exception model is not clean. Something has changed. You need to kind of uh, go back and see what happened in there. Okay, so let me just go in this piece here, fix that. Let me go back here. And then let me do this. There you go, and then I'm just gonna create like a like a, a an example, right? So I'm just gonna go here and say users, users Hassan Habib, code rub, upgrade, uh, uh, test to standard, two ten, oh, right? So there's that, creating that. This is just an example. Of course, if, you, if you've never contributed to open source, there's a great chance for you to kind of go and say, um, uh, upgrade uh, test to standard 2.10.0, right? So I'm just going to go and create a pull request in here for this project. And now uh, we can have a pull request. There you go. And now I can just go and say this is this is the a draft pull request. I I, I can make it um, ready for review, right? But I'll just leave an issue in here and basically say uh, code rub upgrade uh, uh, services to standard 2.2.10.0 like that. Okay. Now someone might say where where do I find this, right? So if you go into the standard, uh, the standard on GitHub, and I'm gonna put this link in the. This is of course part of the series, but um, if you go into the releases v v210, you're gonna find all the changes that I just talked about right now, and you're gonna find a copy of the standard in PDF in here. So this is this is really an important to upgrade. It's a vulnerability in our system. Uh, I will go ahead in here and just put in a documentation. The standard itself, the actual documentation itself, does have these changes, but this is basically like a summary. Here is why this is an important upgrade and why what you should do, what you should do about it. Okay, so let me attach a an issue to this. So I'll just go here and say closes, and here is the upgrade service to 210. <clears throat> of course, there's still a lot of work to be done in here. This is just an example for people to kind of see what it's like in practice. It's a code rub because nothing will fail when you actually make that change. Nothing will fail, right? So it's not really a a, a fail pass kind of change. It's more like it, you could always, you know, choose to completely rewrite the test, but nothing still will fail because it's the same message. So that's what we call a code drop. You basically go through the code that's already working, that's already in production, and basically upgrade it, upgrade it to make it better. Okay, so, so that's all I had in mind. You will be able to see the actual in-depth doc documentation, it shows up as a very um, a small uh, kind of change, but it's extremely important. So I'll show you up in here. In the standard itself, you will see that um, if I just type in message, uh, yeah, there you go. So you'll see in here, public invalid student exception message. You'll see that in here, and you'll basically say every custom exception, whether it's localized or categorized, will essentially have two different constructors. It should be two or more because there are cases like the one that we just saw, you know, for, for whoever wants to do a quick code drop for the standard, it's two or more different constructor. The first constructor embeds the exception message. That's the one that embeds the exception message in here. And then uh, to ease the utilization, so your business logic is just throwing the exception unless you want to localize and show exceptions in different messages, that's up to you. And then the second constructor is mainly for testing 
to ensure messages being communicated through the exception are the proper messages. So your basic for tests to make sure that these messages and then throughout this uh, chapter in the standard, you will see uh, that we're, when we're testing, we're actually explicitly saying the message is supposed to be this explicitly. And you need to kind of basically make sure that nobody changes, changes that model. Finally, which is very important for everyone to understand, my recommendation, this is just a nice to have, it's not mandatory, it's a nice to have, is that I would be um, highly encouraging people without, without enforcement of that rule, at least not just yet, that people actually type out the message in the model because we don't want our models to actually carry any particular uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for I don't want the mo model to be uh, by default carrying a particular message so I would like you know and w encourage and recommend that people kind of have an another overload that would be a fourth one that basically just takes a message like this one because this is handling two different cases right there's the case that's local local validations and then there's the external validations I would recommend that people would go and actually type out the messages in their logic without relying on the default because models are supposed to just carry values that are inserted by the business logic. But if you choose not to do that, I'm not going to have a heartburn on that for now. Like for the time being, 210, 210, you don't have to do that. But if you do it, I'd be very, very encouraging and supportive of, of your effort going into that direction. The must do, that's a nice to do. The must do is that you have to kind of explicitly say what kind of messages your exceptions, your exceptions are going to have. And if you don't do that, then, you know, you have vulnerabilities in your system and you need to do something. You need to do something about it. I hope that uh, this is kind of, like I always say, the standard is always in draft mode, right? We're always growing, we're always evolving. But what makes this standard special, and makes this community very special is that we're actively, daily, trying to upgrade and enhance the way we engineer things. Our code from two years ago is worse than our code from one year ago, is worse than our code from you know, six months ago, it, it keeps getting better and better, right? And that should be the rule across all. We should get smarter, we should evolve, we shouldn't be doing the same things that we've been doing 10 years ago. Otherwise, you're not really growing, you're not really evolving, and you are automatable, you know? Like in, in this age of AI, anybody really could just automate your style. This, what we're showing in here, that's true creativity and innovation, and the standard community will continue to find vulnerabilities like these and tries to solve them. Uh, sorry about the long video. I had to kind of, you know, put something out there that is very specific, and of course that video will be attached under the uh, the footer area in the standard itself. So for people to, to continue to see where this is coming from, I appreciate you all for watching. And if you have any comments, questions, concerns, please feel free to drop a comment in the comment section. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Talk to you later.